Good morning. Good morning. It's so nice to hear that. <laughs> and uh, a bit unusual, too. Uh, I've uh, been enjoying doing worship for you uh, as six people in our worship team gather here that you might know. And, uh, yeah, it's been such an unusual time the last three months, and uh, we're, uh, we're so glad things are getting back to normal a bit. Uh, we also welcome all of our online viewers and are glad you could join us as well, too. Now, for our live stream today, if you're watching us online, we just wanted to let you know we'll be live streaming uh, up through the first part of uh, communion um, as people are coming to the front for communion as a bit of a sacred time or whatever, and uh, maybe a uh, time after the proclamation of the word, and so we probably will we'll sign off uh, at that time. Well, masks, gloves, bulletins, personal space, communion, semantics, details, and everything. Uh, of course, we're not uh, quite back to uh, the, the usual that we're used to. Um, on Thursday, our Board of Elders met for the second time to have a long meeting about how exactly to, to approach things and uh, came up with a plan that we think will, will work well for us and uh, that we'll be able to uh, gather and worship again uh, regularly. The one thing that uh, they had some discussion about, um, though, was singing. And that's because uh, the jury is still out on that, and uh, that act of singing has caused problems in some churches around the world. And uh, some more research and discussions needed on that. And so the Board of Elders, uh, there's going to be some more discussion this week on that and, and everything. But for this first service back, we are going to have music and singing, but we're not going to have congregational singing yet. Just as we need some more time to talk about that and do some study. And so this morning, uh, for our opening and our closing hymn, you're going to hear our seminary chorus as uh, they will do a, a wonderful hymn for us. And then for the uh, verses that are on page four, which are a response to the confession and absolution, and then the sermon hymn, which is on page eight, our worship team will sing that for us today so you can hear them live uh, as they sing that. But stay tuned as uh, we, we make plans for the next few weeks with, with how things will go. So we'll begin our service by uh, hearing the hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past, uh, from our seminary chorus. God bless our worship.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your grace. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Create in me a pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will turn back to you. As we worship the Lord on this Pentecost day, we must admit that we come before him as unworthy sinners. Let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. We pray. Holy Spirit, God and Lord, come to us this joyful day with a sevenfold gift of your grace. Rekindle in our hearts the holy fire of your love, that in a true and living faith we may tell abroad the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our readings today. As our service has already mentioned, it's Pentecost Day. Perhaps you know that Pentecost is the third high festival of the entire year. Uh, the largest one probably is Easter, and then comes Christmas and Pentecost behind it. And yet it's often the forgotten festival. Uh, it is the birth of the New Testament church. It is the sending of the Holy Spirit, and we see that in our readings today. First of all, in the prophet Joel, as uh, it was prophesied about this day in the end times long ago. The Lord says through Joel, Afterward, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. 
and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is from Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament. This is the account of Pentecost Day as the Holy Spirit was poured out 50 days after Jesus rose. When the day of Pentecost came, the disciples were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are all the, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. A verse of the day, Alleluia, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in them the fire of your love. Alleluia. Please stand now out of respect for the reading from the Gospels. We read from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, as Jesus promises his disciples to send the Holy Spirit. This will serve as the basis for our sermon message today. Jesus said, Now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, Where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because of the, the prince of this world now stands condemned. This is the gospel of the Lord. And blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Please be seated for our sermon hymn today, printed on page 8. Once again, our, our worship team will sing that hymn to you today.
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. In the name of the one who sends the Holy Spirit, the one who has returned triumphantly to heaven. Dear brothers and sisters, imagine this scene for a moment. A father gathers his young children. He tells them he has an announcement to make. And so they all go into the living room, and they all sit down, and the father tells them, I have to leave for a while. I have to go far away. There are some things I must do, and I'm not going to be with you for quite a while. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be here to have daily meals with you. I'm not going to be able to catch up with you after school. I'm not going to be able to take you to the sports practice or to music practice. I'm not going to be around in the evenings, and it's going to be quite a while before I am back. Can you imagine the atmosphere in that room after he announces that? I would imagine that a hush would fall over the room. I would imagine there would be some sadness. I would imagine there would be some questions. Like what? Where are you going? Why do you have to go? How long are you going to be gone? What will we do about this while, while you're gone? If you can imagine that scene pretty clearly in your mind, you will have a good idea of what is going on in the upper room as Jesus talks to his disciples the night that he will be betrayed. He tells them, in essence, the same thing. And, and one of the most shocking things he says to them is, it is for your good that I am leaving. How could that be? Today, on Pentecost Day, we have a promise of Jesus to his disciples in the upper room that we're going to focus on just for a few minutes today in our Gospel reading from John 16. And the promise that he gives them is of a comforter. A comforter that will come to them into a perplexed world that will be for their good. Let's see two things in this reading. First of all, that this would be good for disciples of Jesus. And then secondly, it was going to be good for the world in general as Jesus left. The setting of these verses is indeed the, the upper room and Jesus had already made this declaration back in chapter 13 as he has a long discourse with his disciples. He said in verse 13, chapter 13, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. And then he says here in verse 5, I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Yet you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But I tell you, it is for your good that I go away. Good for them. And good for someone else to come and to be with them and to teach them. Why would they want that? Now, you know, Jesus' feelings at this time seem to be a bit hurt. Did you catch that? Yeah, none of you was asking, where, where are you going? You know, nobody had asked him for four chapters now what exactly the details were behind this. Peter had asked him something, but the question Peter had was, hey, what about us? What about us while you're gone? Thomas had asked him, can we follow later? But the questions were a bit selfishly directed. None of them were asking him questions about the important things or about him. They weren't asking him, going to the Father in heaven? What's that like? Or is it true that you're going to rise from the dead, as you say? That's, that's an important thing. None of those deeper things with his teaching, but rather all about them. And yet he still promises to send them, whom he calls here the advocate, the counselor, the comforter. Now, the disciples were going to need the comforter or the advocate. They would need him for a couple reasons. The first reason that they'll need him is because of their ignorance. Just bluntly put, because of their ignorance. You could probably recall in your Bible reading the times where Jesus was surprised and a little bit irritated at their slowness. You're not getting these things? I'll tell you again. I'll tell you again. Or maybe the times where they keep arguing about who's the greatest. 
in the Twelve. Or the times, of course, where, uh, where last week in our Ascension Day service, where they asked him, right when he's going to ascend into heaven, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They had an ignorance that needed to be enlightened. Not only that, they would need this advocate because of fear. They had grief right now, but their grief was going to turn to fear. So much so that where would the disciples be on Easter evening when Jesus appeared to them? Where would they be a week later when he appeared, when Thomas was then with them? They would be in a locked room out of fear for the Jews. That was not supposed to be their status for the rest of their lives. And then also a third reason they would need him is because of hatred. Hatred in the world. Those Jewish leaders who would continue now to plot against them and the early church that had started. Riots that would happen in towns that they would go to in Asia Minor and Greece and Europe because of the message that they were preaching. And also threats of death, direct threats that they were going to have to stand up to in their lives as missionaries. They needed help. They needed a comforter. In John 14, Jesus had said this about that comforter. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. He lives with you, and he will be in you. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. He will guide you in all truth. That Holy Spirit was going to do miraculous things for them after he appeared. Some of them that we saw on the second reading already today. You know, there's, there's two unhealthy extremes that people have with the Holy Spirit. One extreme today is that they have an obsession and emotionalism about the Holy Spirit, so much so that it even distracts from who Jesus is. That there are those who want to see early New Testament signs, outward signs of the Holy Spirit, and they look for these signs, and that's where it's at, so much so that it obscures the cross of Christ. There are some who want to feel the hot breath of the Spirit on them and in them, to, to feel a swooning, to, to feel something, so that they think God has been with them. That is a distraction, though, that is an unhealthy extreme. The other extreme is that people don't know about the Holy Spirit, and they don't care much about the Holy Spirit. They don't think much about Him. They couldn't tell you what He does or where He is in the Scriptures. Really an apathy about the Holy Spirit. We never want to fall into those two ditches. So who is this Holy Spirit? Yeah, the word comforter or counselor or advocate in Greek is paraclete. Maybe some of you who've been in church for a few years, you remember some older prayers and hymns where the word paraclete, the Greek word, is, is used. Literally, it means to call to your side. Have them called to your side. So it can mean a helper. It can mean an aide. It can mean a counselor. And in that day, it also meant a lawyer who could help you, an advocate, a friend, a, a comforter. English words kind of struggle to catch the meaning. But this person would do mar 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 miraculous things for those disciples. He would enlighten them. He would give them courage. He would be with them as they preached and proclaimed. He would lead them to write the books of the New Testament scriptures. And he would be with them as they combated that evil world against them. He would do miraculous things for them. This was good for the disciples. Now, you're disciples of Jesus, right? So this is good for you, correct? Have you thought about that lately? What does the paraclete do for you? Well, you know, one thing is that we would have gone on in our ignorance if he had never come into our life as well. In 1 Corinthians 2, it says, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. You never could make your decision for Christ. You never could choose him. You never could want the good. You have just a sinful nature inside of you before your conversion. The Holy Spirit had to come and change your heart and touch you. 
1 Corinthians 12 also says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. This, this is a miracle that we should be amazed at and thankful for every day. And not only that, he also helps us in our life of spiritual growth now. He is the one who works through the word. He's the one who works through the sacrament. He's the one who comes to you and keeps you strong for the journey through life. Therefore, we should use his means, use his word, and use it often so that he can work. Maybe today's a good day to ask yourself, since he's a, a good thing for disciples of Jesus, am I using his word? Am I using it often? Am I using it enough? Am I diving deep into the scriptures? This is a, a great encouragement for us because you have an advocate, a counselor, a comforter, a helper. May this be an encouragement for us disciples. Now there's one other angle here as well. Not only would this be good for those disciples and, and us disciples, it would also be good for the world that this paraclete would come. In verse 8 it said, When he comes, he will prove to the world that they are in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now, this is a, a deep dive here into the pool. There's some deep words here and some, some deep thoughts. What does this mean, that it will be good for the world? The, the key word here is the one for proving the world to be wrong or convicting the world. That word literally means to bring to light and expose. It's a courtroom term. Like someone's on the stand and the questions have been so skillful that someone is now exposed with what they do. It's often a bad word, and someone is convicted. It can mean a good thing at some times where you might convince someone of something. But the point is, it will convict the world of sin. How will that be so? Well, because sin is still in the world, what does that show about hearts? Whenever there's impenitence, whenever there's unbelief, whenever there's someone who doesn't want to know or believe in God and someone who has blocked him and defied him, which God gives you the ability to do, sin stays. And sin will be there on the last day. It's like the verse in 1 John 1 that says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. In another sense, the, the Holy Spirit can also just look at this world in general, and what does he see? Read the paper, what do you see? Watch the news, what do you see? A lot of sin, because there are hard hearts, and the world deserves convicting because of that. Not only that, but secondly here, he will also convict the world or convince the world about righteousness, because Jesus is going to the Father. What, what does that mean? Well, what was Jesus going to do? What was he leaving to do? He was going to be arrested. He was going to be punished, suffering, dying, crucified. He was going to do that to convince or convict the world of righteousness. The acts that he was going to do at that time were going to convict the world because they cost it. But not only that, they could be convinced that it was for them. This was a good thing, that they could be convinced of righteousness. Not only this, but they would also be convicted of judgment, because the prince of this world stood judged already. You know, there's many people who don't believe that judgment is coming. There are many people who poo-poo that and say, oh, that's just a fairy tale. Jesus says, look at the devil. After all, it began with the devil. It began with the devil who was judged even before the first sin, who then came into the Garden of Eden and ushered in the first sin. It all begins with the devil. And what happened to him? Well, in Matthew 25, when Jesus talks about the last day, he says to those who don't follow him, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Judgment begins with him as well. This will certainly come despite what people say today. You know, 2 Peter, it says, You must understand that in the last days, scoffers.
Scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on just as it has since the beginning of creation. Yes, Jesus says, these three things will happen. That paraclete will convict and convince the world of sin and of judgment and yet of righteousness. Now this is strong encouragement for us today on Pentecost Sunday. Because this is good for the world even now. How is this strong encouragement for us? Because how does God carry that out? What does God do? He works through the Word. And as He works through the Word, He's going to work through not only church services that people wander into, TV channels that someone flips around and finds a religious service as a decent message, He's also going to hear that through you. And He will work through you for the world. The paraclete is going to work through you. That might make you rather fearful about what to say. The right words? What can I say? When do I say it? But don't forget the promise about that spirit in Matthew, where Jesus said to them, When they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your Father speaking through you. This will be good. So I am leaving, Jesus says, and it's a good thing for your good. Maybe we wouldn't have understood that at the beginning of this service, but maybe we do now. That this will be good for the disciples, that their power source, their encourager and comforter is going to come to them for remission. And also that this will be good for the world, as he does his work through his people, as the comforter of all. So today on Pentecost Day, may we rejoice. May we rejoice that Jesus made this promise. May we rejoice that the Comforter came as he said. And may we pray that he would continue to come to us for our strengthening. And also for our speaking. As this is also good for the world. Amen. Please rise. Now that the peace that surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in true faith, the life of the last day. <laughs> we confess our faith together on the top of page 10 with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come in the Lord to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one Christian, Christian, and a solid church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. For our offerings uh, in the next week, so we will not be gathering one and passing plates among each other, but there will be a plate at the door on a little stand for you to leave your offering uh, with there as uh, you leave God's house today. Therefore, we'll continue with the prayers. In our prayers today, we uh, offer a prayer on this Pentecost Day for Scott and Ashley Neiman. Uh, the Lord bless them with the gift of a healthy daughter, Evelyn Jean. Um, we also offer a prayer for our communicants today and a prayer.
prayer that the Lord would continue to be with our world during this time. Holy Spirit of God, we worship and glorify you as the Lord and giver of all spiritual life. By our own thinking and choosing, we would still be lost in our sins, wandering in spiritual darkness toward eternal death. Only by your gift of faith do we now confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord. Only by your enlightenment do we know the loving heart of our Father in heaven and his promise of eternal life in Christ. We thank you for fulfilling the word given by prophets and the promise spoken by the Lord Jesus. You came down on the day of Pentecost to guide and comfort the apostles, lead them all in all truth, and give them courage for their mission of proclaiming the gospel. We praise you also for calling us as disciples by the gospel, making us sons and daughters of God, giving us faith in Christ. You gather us as his flock here into the Holy Christian Church, where we will hear the shepherd's voice proclaiming this for our own benefit all our life. Lead us now to share that word so that this message might be good for the world and that many might come to know you as Lord and Savior as well. Also, Lord God, we give thanks to you for the wonderful way again in which you bring children into this world. We thank you still more that you can send Jesus to adopt this child into your family for holy baptism. We pray until that time that you would bless this household, make the parents models of your love with their new child, make your church a fellowship of encouragement and admonition to foster growth and godliness in her. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who welcomes the little children. And Lord Jesus, you call all who are weary and burdened to come to you for rest. Rejoicing in your grace, we come today to this heavenly feast in which you give your children on earth your body and blood. Remove from us the soiled garments of self-righteousness and sin, and clothe us with the righteousness purchased with your blood. Strengthen our faith, increase our love, especially for those with whom we share this blessed communion today. And after this life, grant us a place at your heavenly table. And Lord God, we pray that you would continue to give this world the help that only you can give. We ask that you would spare people in our country and around the world from harm from this pandemic. Grant healing and comfort to those who are afflicted. Give wisdom and steadfastness to our nation's leaders and a spirit of courage and cooperation to our communities. Above all, use your word to work in us a strong faith and trust in your promises. We can be confident because your promises in this uncertain time are certain. Also, Lord, we pray for you during uncertain times in our nation and world. We pray that you would stop the violence. We pray that there would not be injustice. We pray that there would be wisdom across our nation, godly wisdom, and we pray that people would treat each other with the love that you have treated us. Lord God, we also pray as you have taught us together. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We will speak the responses of the opening for the sacrament on page 11. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. You lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. Our Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Please be seated as uh, we'll give instructions now for the community. As we do receive communion today, uh, we try to eliminate the personal passing and space and, and everything that people at this time. And so once again, like we did in March, we'll offer a continuous uh, communion uh, with the distributor back a little ways. The way this will work is this site will commute first. Uh, please keep six feet of distance between people as you approach. There are two stations. 
first for the bread and then for the wine. You will be ushered out to your right. So then please come up that aisle, come to the bread. You may select the wafer. Please pause also, if this isn't meant to be in the Sunday line or anything. Please pause at the table at your corner. Consume that, listen to the, the administrator. And then come over here, and you may select your wine and everything. And then when you return, please continue down the aisle all the way back to the back and back to your seat. After that, this side can come in. Please uh, wait for the direction of the ushers. Please go back to the back and then around and return to your seat from that side. So basically, you are exiting your road to the right and you'll be coming back in on the left. I've got a lot of students uh, at the uh, community. 